I'm going to begin part two of this lecture on Lazi Ukrainka with just a short summary of part one. And in that first part, I attempted to get beyond the bronze and granite of Lazi's statue in High Park in Toronto by delving into the particulars of her extraordinary background. She had the most enlightened and unpatriarchal family you can think of and uh, extremely rich cultured upbringing. I was also stressing in part one the importance of the 17th century proto-state that we now call by the name the Hetmanate and the origins of Lassia's mother's family within its nobility, just sort of stressing that Lassia's um, social origins were very much not peasant, but um, aristocratic actually on both her parents' side. Now, given the destruction of the Hetmanate and its absorption into the Russian Empire as Malorossiya or Little Russia, I went on to talk about the far-ranging consequences on Lassia Ukrainka's life and work of her cherished homeland subordination within 19th century Greater Russia. I mentioned the malignant extent to which Tsarist autocracy attempted not just to curb, but also to banish the use of the Ukrainian language. And this Tsarist assertion, is really quite peculiar, very contradictory. First of all, that there was no such thing as Ukrainian, but also that Ukrainian was far too subversive and powerful a language to be permitted to flourish. The Ems Ukaz of 1876, forbidding the use of Ukrainian, except for historical documents, was the apex of that malign um, act. And the antithesis was the determination and ability of Lasya Ukrainka and other writers to smuggle their Ukrainian language texts into Russian controlled Ukraine. So it's a kind of samizdat. And I concluded part one with the observation that for Lesa Ukrainka, intellectual and creative work and what she called the sweetness of struggle were the only food for hope that Ukraine and its language and culture would one day be freed from the virtual slavery inflicted by Russian political imperatives. In this context, I want to mention that I'll be using Ukrainian forms of place names rather than their Russian equivalents. So I'll say Kyiv and not Kiev, and Dnipro, and not Dnieper. And now let's begin part two with Lesya Ukrainka in her identity as Larisa Kosach, that is, as the woman who struggle against another form of oppression, a severe illness contracted when she was a child of 10, reached a crisis point by the time she reached her 30s, forcing her into partial, but painful exile from her family and friends, her homeland and her language. Larissa Kosach's first 20 years were spent mostly in the region of Volenia, some 400 kilometers northwest of Keiu, either in the provincial towns where her father worked as an administrator, towns like Zvyahel, where she was born, Lutsk and Kovel, or on her parents' country estate, Kolodyazhne, when she came to write the drama Lisa the Pisnia, or Forest Song, she drew on her knowledge of the woods and lakes near Kolodyazhne and the legends and folklore associated with them. Her closeness to the natural world and the intimacy with which she writes of landscape and natural phenomena remind me of other writers who are closely connected to their native places, Thomas Hardy or Emily Bronte or Colette. Yet Larissa was passionately fond of city life as well, taking an active part in intellectual and cultural gatherings in Keiu and making full use of the city's museums, art galleries and concert halls. And she was in her own way gregarious. The three volumes of her collected correspondence show that she was no recluse of the stamp of Emily Dickinson or Emily Bronte. The remarkable pace at which she wrote and published shows how necessary it was for her to make connections with and present challenges to the world outside her room of her own. One of her close friends was the feminist writer Olha Kobylyanska, some 10 years her senior and with whom she conducted a passionate correspondence. In 1901, Larissa spent a summer in Kobylyanska's birthplace, Bukovina, a southeastern sort of transitional region whose borders have shifted over the years between today's Ukraine and Romania. 
And I love this picture of these, these two young women um, who are looking at us with such stern faces and such dedication to their art. But as her disease progressed, Larissa had to spend more and more time abroad, traveling in search of expert medical care and warmer winter climates. It's exhausting just to register the extent of Las, Larissa Kosach's peregrinations in the last 15 years of her life. From 1897 to 1912, she wintered three times in the Crimea, twice in San Remo, Italy, three times in Egypt, and three times in the Caucasus. She undertook her last two journeys to Egypt alone by boat, surviving storms at sea, mined waters because there was a war going on, um, uh, Turkey and I think it was Serbia, so the Black Sea was mined, and freezing fogs, which were not great for her lungs. Traveling abroad, she was torn. While she welcomed as much as the cultural stimulus offered by foreign lands as her health permitted, she also saw herself as a hothouse plant, ripped from its native soil and reduced to the confines of a clay pot, carted around from one artificial atmosphere to another. What Larissa struggled with during her periods of forced exile wasn't just the knowledge that warmer climates could never be a cure for the disease that was killing her, but also the lack of that nurturance given her by immersion in her native language, among family and friends and beloved familiar places. And I find this, uh, this image uh, from the family album of Larissa. Um, you can see her in the middle standing beside her mother and looking at the baby held by, I think this is her younger sister, Olga. And she apparently was very, very fond of her nieces and nephews. So to be taken away from all of this was extremely painful for her. So what do we know of Larissa Kosach's character and her temperament? She was of an age and a background that demanded privacy on personal matters. Unfortunately for us, her husband declined to publish any memoirs of their life together that would give us an intimate or relaxed portrait of his wife. Lesia Ukrainka or Larissa Kosach, her given name, she may smile in one or two of her childhood photographs, but never as an adult when her likeness was being taken. So like Tolstoy, did she utterly lack a sense of humor? Was she the author of preponderantly tragic works, lacking in the kind of warmth, playfulness, ease with others that make up that elusive thing we call charm? Or is it outrageous to ask for charm in the characters of exceptional people to want to like as well as respect them, especially in the case of those who are seriously ill? The fact that Larissa Kosach described living with tuberculosis as her 30 years war is evidence of a grim sense of humor. The sentimentalized form of tuberculosis, consisting in plaintive cough, a feverish flush, and ethereal slenderness of body, is far more brutal in reality. Tuberculosis of the bone in an age without antibiotics involved painful swelling of the joints and eventual deformation of the bones. The adult Larissa had to wear a prosthesis on one of her legs. Unchecked, the bacillus spreads to other organs. It leads to extreme fatigue and the pain it inflicts can be so agonizing that it can, as it did in Larissa's case, cause loss of consciousness. The Lassia Ukrainka was able to write as much and as well as she did is miraculously. When she writes in a poem entitled Hope Against Hope, that she will live, that she refuses to give in to despair, she writes in blood, not mere ink. Struggle was her very being, just as fire was her native element, the fire of determined, passionate attachment to Ukraine, and the tubercular fire or fever that towards the end caused throngs of images to invade her consciousness, making sleep or even rest impossible. Her muse, she claimed, drinks my blood by God. If Larissa Kosach defied her disease and the politics which circumscribed her life, she also defied social conventions and familial values when these contradicted her own deeply held beliefs. She loved and admired her parents, 
but she refused to be a fille bien rangée, to use Simone de Beauvoir's term. A well-brought-up daughter does not, for example, translate the Communist Manifesto, which she did in 1902. Nor does she fall in love with a Marxist revolutionary and fellow sufferer from TB, whom she first met in Yalta in 1897, a Belarusian named Serhii Merzhinsky. She certainly does not travel to him as he lies dying, keeping a vigil by his bedside, nor does she spend hours after he dies writing a dramatic poem she entitles Odrzyma, or A Woman Obsessed. Lasya Ukrainka was capable of creating a version of the Don Juan legend in which Donna Anna shows herself to be stronger and far more independent than the man who tries to conquer her. And Lasya Ukrainka was capable of writing a love poem that begins, my heart burns up in a rage of fire. Reviewing her 1902 poem cycle, Nevilny Chipisny, Songs of Slaves, the preeminent Ukrainian writer and critic Ivan Franko remarked, reading the light and disjointed or cold moralistic writings of our contemporary Ukrainian writers and comparing them with those cheerful, vigorous and courageous writings of Lester Ukrainka, one cannot help reflecting that this sick, weak girl is more of a man than anyone else in the whole Ukraine of today. Ukraine cannot, in our opinion, boast today of a poet who can compare with Lasya Ukrainka as far as the force and versatility of her talent are concerned. So it's kind of a backhanded compliment. She's a sick, weak girl, but she's got more balls than her male equivalents do who are trying to write of Ukraine. Now there's an adjective in Ukrainian, chemna, which means polite, well-behaved, orderly. Larissa Kosach was hardly chemna, not only in her passionate attachment to Olha Kobylanska or Sergei Merzhinsky, but also when defying her parents' disapproval, she lived in a common law relationship for five years with a penniless scholar nine years younger than she. Clement Kvitka was a lawyer by profession, but by vocation a musicologist, ethnographer, and linguist. He spoke 13 languages to Lassia's 12. And on the, uh, the picture, the family picture is, shows a very, very young looking Clement standing in the middle with his sister, her husband, and their two children. He was not a socialist or a revolutionary like the men she'd been formerly attached to. His surname Kvitka actually means flower. Kosach and Kvitka married in 1907 to confer on Clement the respectability that would allow him to secure a government job and thus an income sufficient to meet Lassia's mounting medical costs. For her part, once involved with Kvitka, Lassia refused all financial help from her parents, earning what she could by translating and tutoring. Accounts of her last years of life are sobering. Disease emaciated her to the point where she was all spirit. A friend described her during a final visit to Kiev just weeks before her death as a pale translucent figure with arms full of flowers, with words full of energy, love and faith, and with death in her eyes. On the day she left Kiev, she went to Volodymyrska Hirka, a hilltop park marked by a statue of Knyaz or Prince Volodymyr, the greatest ruler of ancient Rus. Gazing down at the Dnipro River and at the various landmarks of Kiev, she took leave of them forever. Then she set out on the long, arduous train journey south to Tiflis Gubernia, now the country of Georgia, in which, two months later, she would die in the arms of her husband and mother. Her body was brought back to Kiev for a public funeral. Her coffin was shouldered by six women, and she specified women to be the pallbearers, as it processed to the Baikovo Cemetery where her beloved father and older brother were buried. Police supervised the procession, lest it become insubordinate. Even the words on the wreaths for her grave had to be approved by the government censors. Now I want to talk a little about Lassia Ukrainka's oeuvre, her body of work. 
To get a sense of the status and influence of Ukrainka in her homeland, it helps to put her into the company of her younger contemporary, Virginia Woolf, and Woolf's place in our English-speaking world. Both women have become literary icons, the familiar faces of certain kinds of literariness. In many ways, they were strikingly different. Virginia Woolf wrote prose, and Las Ukrainka mostly wrote poetry. Woolf was an iconoclastic modernist, whereas Ukrainka worked within the conventions of late 19th century aestheticism. Ukrainka read and used biblical narratives compulsively in her work, whereas Woolf was an out and out atheist. Ukrainka's work has none of the playfulness, the mockery and sheer brio of so much of Woolf's writing. But most importantly, unlike her Ukrainian counterpart, Virginia Woolf was able to write and publish freely in her native language. Yet there are striking similarities between these writers. Both were born into an intellectual and cultural elite. Both became strong feminists devoted to acquiring the kind of learning thought unsuitable for their gender. For example, knowledge of ancient Greek. They read widely, gobbling up books from their parents' libraries at an early age. They wrote articles and essays on a wide range of subjects in order to help earn their livings. And they belonged to some of the most influential cultural circles of their day. Both women struggled with severe ill health that often confined them to bed and prevented them from writing. Mental illness in Wolf's case and tuberculosis in Ukrainka's. If there are fewer book and tote bags with Ukrainka's face on them, there are far more statues of Lasya Ukrainka commemorating her importance as a writer. In any case, their physical image is out there in the non-literary world, as well as in the pages of their books. And I should just point out that the image that you see of Ukrainka's face on brick walls, there's sort of three uh, in the center right there, um, was actually, uh, created during the 2014 Maidan protests in Kiev. So she was very much there in spirit. What of the literature Ukrainka created so little known outside Ukraine compared to Wolf's extensively translated work? Those who have access only to the few available English language versions of Ukrainska's poetry will be looking at it through a shard of pebbled glass. Most translations date from the 1950s and 60s and tend to be overly exalted. Though they communicate Ukrainka's dedication to form, they cannot duplicate the power and the intricacy of her use of rhythm and rhyme. And they tend to favor the writer's more overtly patriotic themes. University of Ottawa professor Konstantin Bida, writing in 1968 when Ukraine was still under the control of the Soviet Union, emphasized Ukrainka's staunch devotion to her native land, citing her focus on self-sacrificing love. Danilo Struk, who was professor at University of Toronto's Slavic Studies Department, writing after the demise of the Soviet Union on Lasya Ukrainka, offers a different perspective on her aesthetics. Now he translates key passages in her letters and he gives us a vivid sense of what she believed about her own art. When, for example, one of her correspondents asked, how difficult is it to write poetry? She replied, actually, it's most difficult to decide not to write poems, for that's not work, but rather momentary improvisations, attacks of insanity, for which a person generally cannot be held responsible. And as for writing by patriotic prescription, she suggested that it might be an idea to prevent Ukrainians from writing national patriotic poems for a certain length of time. Then, she observed, they might learn more quickly the art of versification, forced into it by reading lyrical poems and by doing translations. As it is, they count more on the patriotism of their readers than on their own rhyme and meter. Now, another correspondent reproached her for writing poems steeped in snobbish intellectualism rather than the speech of the people. Or they criticized her for the lack of strong, overt messages in her work. And Ukrainka replied that if she were to pull her muse by the hair to elicit such messages, then all will hear her unfortunate hair cracking. Finally, 
As Danilo Struk observes, Nancy Ukrainka won for herself a place in the pantheon of Ukrainian writers who advanced the cause of nationhood without sacrificing the conviction that art had to be art and good art at that. And I'll just read a quotation from Ukrainka's letters. It is the duty of everyone who writes poems and not only for a lark to find the appropriate form. Not all of those who write among us have understood this duty and think that for such a poor literature as ours, anything will do. And for this reason, they print things which they would never dare show any editorial office of a foreign publication. But I think that such writers either do not respect themselves or they do not respect Ukrainian literature. I nevertheless do not consider our literature a beggar. And therefore, if my work is not up to standard, then it is because I cannot do it any better. Ukrainka's lyrical poems range in subject from romantic love to love of her benighted, threatened country. She tackles issues of social justice and human rights, and she also immerses herself in the natural world. Spring bringing delusive hope with its brightness, dream like summer, autumn with its blood-stained fingers. She writes of exile, Dante, cast out of Florence, and draws comparisons in her Hebrew melodies cycle between the enslavement of Jews and Ukrainians. When in her maturity, she turns from lyric poetry to poetic drama, she explores the psychology of painfully conflicted characters. Ukrainian critic Volodymyr Yarmolenko, who compares her best dramatic work to that of Aeschylus, Shakespeare and Racine, sums up the remarkable range of Ukrainka's subject matter and insists on the imaginative intensity of her writing. Quote, she wrote about early Christians in the Roman Empire, about ancient Greece and ancient Egypt, about the Scottish Wars for Independence and the French Revolution, about Spanish Baroque culture, English Puritans in North America, and of course, her native Ukrainian folklore. She translated into Ukrainian from German, French, English, Sanskrit, ancient Greek, Egyptian, and more. When Ukrainian culture was imprisoned in an artificial provinciality, she filled it with the voices of literary culture from around the world. But all those global topics were not merely abstract, neither to her nor to her people. She wrote about these ancient themes by channeling her own experience. So when she was writing about early Christians, she felt herself a member of a catacomb people, a community of the faithful, persecuted by an empire. Some of Lazio Ukrainka's most deeply held views may strike us in our post-postmodernity as unfashionable or untenable. For example, that it's shameful to surrender to fate without a fight, that our task as human beings is to struggle towards our goals at whatever cost to our own personal happiness, our own personal fulfillment. Among Lazio Ukrainka's goals were freedom for her country and survival for her native culture. In this context, I'm going to give you my very free translation of one of Lazio Ukrainka's poems that seems especially resonant now. It has no title. It was written on November 25th, 1896. Words, why aren't you tempered steel shooting sparks through the murk of war? Why aren't you the kind of merciless blade that slices an enemy's head from his shoulders? You, my truthful, resilient language, I'm ready to unsheath and reveal you. You alone can shed the blood of my heart without breaking the blade of that heart. I must sharpen and keep on polishing this glittering weapon with all my strength then hang it on a wall for the delight of others and for my own pain. Words, my only weapon. We mustn't die together, you and I. Perhaps in the hands of unknown brothers, you'll be a better sword against our enemies. Blades ring against iron shackles, echoing to the strongholds of tyrants. Echoes rebounding from other swords, clashing, making the sound of the newly freed. 
Avengers will take up my weapon, rush with it, braving all battlefields. My weapon, my words, serve these soldiers better than you've served my invalid's hands. Bronze and paper. How lovely it would be to die like a falling star, observed Vasya Ukrainka. When an asteroid was discovered between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter on August 28, 1970, it was given her name, 2616 Lassia. Is it a more fitting tribute than a monument cast in bronze mounted on a granite plinth? There are so many statues of and memorial plaques dedicated to Lesya Ukrainka in cities ranging from Kiev to Cleveland, from St. Petersburg in Russia to Saskatoon in Canada, from the Volinian city of her birth to the Georgian village where she died. As welcome and valuable as these markers are, to me the most important sign of Lazar Ukrainka's living presence is the fact that she continues to inspire other artists. To list just two examples, Oksana Zabushko, often described as Ukraine's Margaret Atwood, has written a magnum opus entitled Notre Dame d'Ukraine. It is written actually in, in uh, Ukrainian, not in French, despite the title. And Georgian filmmaker Nana Yanelidza is in the process of making a feature film on Ukrainka's life. As far as I know, the trailer for this film has been released, so you can Google it. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when this, uh, this uh, biopic is going to be released for general viewing. On day 20th of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I made my way to High Park defying the double ring of fences, enclosing Cherishnyovsky's statue of Lasya Ukrainka. It was a gray, misty day. The darkened bronze seemed to mesh with the bare branches and pine boughs around her. From what I'd learned about the poet's life and work, this seemed almost criminal. Fire, not mist, is her native element. I looked up at the calm, conventionally pleasing face above the high-necked collar of her Madonna-like dress, remembering all the while her line, my heart burns in a rage of fire. And then I read and actually registered for the first time the words inscribed on the back of the granite plinth. They pay tribute to the Women's Council of the Ukrainian Canadian Committee, who managed to raise the funds to commission this monument to mark the United Nations Declaration of 1975 as National Women's Year. The inscription also acknowledges the presence at the statues unveiling of the poet's sister Isidora Kosach Borisova, who would have been 87 years old at the time. The fact of this meeting between Larissa Kosach's sister, her own flesh and blood, nearing the end of her life, and the imperishable bronze woman on the plinth seemed unbearably poignant as did the fact of Isidora's presence among the women who had realized the idea of a bronze and granite tribute to Ukrainka's memory. Small offerings had been left in front of the iron railing, candles, a stylized sheaf of wheat, a blue and yellow flag. It was time, I thought, high time, to take down the wooden fence and build a pathway to the statue time to remove or at least make it easier to open the railing. Perhaps it is time as well to plant some flowers. Small gestures, but in a time of overwhelming danger and disruption, when so much is at stake and so many lives are being wrenched out of their accustomed shape, not only in Ukraine, but wherever the brutality of war scorches all hope, and turns faith in the future into something less yielding than granite, even a small gesture has value. At least, I would like to hope so. Thank you.